Right, greetings. This is Robert Rowe, and this is my opening for the local position of Noah's Flood. And um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. And I'm going to read it out right now. So, Noah's Flood, a localized catastrophe in the Persian Gulf. Introduction. The 20th century saw the rise of creation scientists, pseudoscientific individuals that have a zeal for defending the reliability of Genesis, yet ironically paved the way for an embarrassing downfall of their models. When real scientific data is presented via peer review, Thus, they, since they wrongly assume that the higher critics are correct when so-called contradictions are presented between established scientific models and a literal reading of Genesis, the only remaining motive is to discredit the accepted scientific notions and re-establish science in terms that would appear to be in, in concordance with their particular interpretation, which they deem the only correct interpretation of Genesis. It all started with a book published in 1923 by George Price. He was a Seventh-day Adventist and an amateur geologist. He insisted that Genesis 6-9 reports a relatively recent global deluge, claiming that it accounts for all the geologic features on all the continents, all the fossils, and all Earth's limestone, coal, oil, gas, and topsoil deposits. Thus the sediments, fossils, and fossil fuels were laid down quickly in this global deluge, not through hundreds of events over millions of years. Unsurprisingly, he cared little that his views found no support among professional scientists. Uh, but most unfortunately, his anti-intellectual and anti-science bias still echoes in church today. Then rose the camps of high criticism and uh, high critics and evolutionists, albeit theistic evolutionists, in response to his claims. Thus, this prompted uh, two Christians, John Whitcomb and Henry Morris, to uh, publish a rebuttal in 1961. It was their hope that it would sort to put some scientific meat onto the bones of Price, Price's flood geology, thus to establish a recent special creation as the only orthodox interpretation of Genesis. Again, unsurprisingly, it gained a tremendous boost from a new sense of desperation in the fundamentalist Christian camp. Why desperation? Because these Christians were finding fewer years sympathetic to their ironic ridiculing of the scientific method that contradicted their worldview. It's without doubt that the scientific method continues to experience unending success and naturally offers a much higher economic benefit for the civilized West. Nowhere do we see the use of flood geology as the basis for these scientific advancements. Thus, these Christians felt the need to respond to the so-called anti-Christian establishment of the scientific method. Ron Numbers states, quote, their once marginal views inspired by the visions of an Adventist prophetess, uh, Ellen White, now define the very essence of creationism. A major irony emerges from the uh, creation scientists. Their anti-science approach forces them to embrace the principles of evolutionism more tightly than any atheist biologist would. These creation scientists teach that all species were herbivores until the fall. Because carnivorous activity involves biological death, they presume that its introduction is due to the ramifications of human sin. Accordingly, they propose that the meat-eating kinds 
must have evolved in a mere several hundred years by natural processes from their original plant-eating kinds. The ark's maximum ca carrying capacity, by their estimates, involved roughly 30,000 pairs of kinds. But the fossil record has roughly 100 million species, of which 5 million live on Earth today. Other estimates are around 8.7 8 million species. Uh, furthermore, they acknowledge that shortly after the global deluge, most of the 30,000 species on board, in this case, in their model, the dinosaurs, the trilobites, and others, went extinct. Therefore, the remaining few thousand species must have evolved by extremely rapid and hyper-efficient natural processes into a total current estimate of one trillion species. Thus, it doesn't seem to rationally occur to them that if such a naturalistic evolutionary process did proceed with such high speed, the changes would be easily observable in real time, and we wouldn't need artificial lab experiments simulating evolution for 4,000 years. Philip Kitcher put it succinctly, Suppose that the Earth really was created about 10,000 years ago, with the major kinds fashioned then and diversifying only a little since. How are we to account for the distributions of isotopes in the Earth's crust? How are we to explain the regular worldwide ordering of the fossils? The only creationist response to the latter question has been in, to invoke the Nokine uh, deluge. Uh, the order is as it is because of the relative positions of the uh, relative positions of the organisms at the time the flood struck. Take this suggestion seriously and you face some obvious puzzles. Sharks and dolphins are found at the same depths, but of course the sharks occur much, much lower in the fossil record. Pine trees, fir trees, deciduous trees are mixed in forests around the globe, and yet the deciduous trees are latecomers in the worldwide fossil record. Maybe we should suppose that the oaks and beeches saw the water rising and outran their evergreen rivals. Far from being a solution to creationism's problems, the flood is a real disaster. Consider biogeography. The ark lands on Ararat, say 8,000 years ago, and out pop the animals. Let's be kind and forget the plants. We now have 8,000 years for the marsupials to find their way to Australia, crossing several large bodies of water in the process. Perhaps you can imagine a few energetic kangaroos making it, but the wombats? Moreover, the uh, creationists think that while the animals were sorting themselves out, there was diversification of species within the, quote, basic kinds. Jackals, Coyotes, foxes, and dogs descend, so the story goes, from a common dog kind. Now, despite all the sarcasm then, that they have lavished on orthodox evolutionary theories' alleged high rates of speciation, a simple calculation shows that, that the rates of speciation in creation science would require to manage the supposed amount of species diversification are truly breathtaking. Orders of magnitude greater that, than any that have been dreamed of in evolutionary theory. Finally, to touch on just one more problem, creationists have to account for the survival of thousands of parasites that are specific to our species. During the days on the ark, these would have had to be carried by less than 10 people. One can only speculate about the degree of ill health that Noah and his crew must have suffered. Okay, returning to my comments, that's Philip Ketcher. So my comments are, all problems vanish away if we understand that the real meaning of the Hebrew word min that is used in uh, Genesis 1. We shouldn't rely on outdated translations like the KJV where the word kind is used. In fact, 
we see a much narrower definition for min. Leviticus 11.22 lists the locust, catty, uh, the caddy did, the cricket, uh, and uh, grasshopper as distinct min. Deuteronomy 14 verse 12 to 18 lists the eagle, falcon, hawk, red kite, black kite, vulture, and black vulture as separate min. In both Leviticus 11 verse 15 to 17 and Deuteronomy 14 verse 15 to 17, you have the hound or owl, the screech owl, little owl, great owl, and white owl or are all referred to as individual men. Walter Kaiser notes, God, quote, God created the basic forms of life called men, which can be classified according to modern biologists and zoologists as sometimes species, sometimes genus, sometimes family or order. Now, finally, it's important to note that the Septuagint uses genos in Genesis to denote species of animals and plants. The biblical origin of the scientific method. In the New Testament, Paul reminds the Ephesian Christians of the psychology of the pagans. Quote, that is not the way you came to know the Messiah. Surely you have listened to him and have been taught by him since truth is in Jesus. There are three forms of diction here that bear testimony to a specific idea, the image of a messianic school. Jesus himself gave halakhic uh, uh, instructions to his disciples. A result of this instruction consisted first of notebooks written by the, by the disciples and of a collection of such notes which took the form of gospel accounts, and then finally of the canonization of the four gospels. In Ephesians 5.20, our literal translation is, you have learned the Messiah. Paul intends to present Christ as the Logos of all the sciences. Thus, the school of Christ is the alternative to perversion and futility operating in and produced by idolatry. In this school, ignorance is replaced by knowledge. The refusal to know God is overcome by the joy of acknowledging God uh, and giving him glory in mind and deed. Knowledge is the essence of that renewal. Such knowledge could not be claimed as a monopoly by anyone because, quote, you have only one teacher, the Messiah. Being raised in the cultured cities of the Hellenistic world, the Ephesians held that education alone was strong enough to dispel darkness and overcome evil. But Paul had experienced both the potential and the limits of the schooling. Therefore, he reminds his readers of a school unique in kind, bearing the name of Christ, because, quote, truth is in Jesus. Pilate asked the timeless question, what is truth? In Latin, it is quid est veritas. The anagrammatic answer is amazing. Est ver que adest, translated, it is the man who is here. Melito says, who is this God? It is he who is himself truth and whose word is truth. And what is truth? That which is not fashioned or made or represented by art, that is, that has never been brought into existence and is on that account called truth since it is that which is fixed and invariable. If someone worships that which is made with hands, it is not the truth that he worships, or yet the word of truth. Belief in Christ alone is not sufficient. Christ will only be recognized in a life of truth. This is how the scientific method was born. Honest scholars don't shy away from highlighting how biblical convictions gave rise to the scientific age. A willingness to pursue continual progressive testing uh, of the Bible's nature, the, the, of the Bible and nature's data, will lead us closer to, to quote, to present yourselves to God as an approved worker who has nothing to be ashamed of, handling the word of truth with precision. Belief must always remain open to scrutiny with the goal of approaching ever more closely 
though never fully attaining the whole truth. Thus our confession is this, quote, the Logos became flesh and lived among us. Jesus Christ, the truth incarnate, is the reason and instrument for turning away from the futility of the pagans and beginning a new life. Therefore, Christianity is a school of wisdom in which wisdom incarnates to be the light of life as well as a guide for the perplexed. Severian states, the image has come into the world and investigates nature. He looks for plants and finds them, investigating their roots. He understands. He becomes an artisan and the inventor of all things. But so that he does not think to have found these things by himself, and not thanks to the power of him who gave this capacity to his nature, by a single discourse it is indicated that God is the teacher of all these things to our nature. Most significant is the work of Thomas Torrance, documenting how Christian theology played a critical role in the birth and development of the scientific method that led to amazing advances. The scientific method involves a series of steps designed to help investigators tentatively develop interpretations and subsequently improve those interpretations. Since the biblical testing method closely resembles the scientific method, one can then recognize that Genesis 1 reads like a primer on the scientific method. In Genesis 1, you have an opening identifying the initial conditions, then you have an orderly description of a sequence of events, and then you have a closing on the final conditions and with some conclusions. And here's the, the photo showcasing this. You have uh, the point of view on the surface of Earth. The, the, it, it mentions that there's a, a, a complete like global ocean around it. You have the atmospheric layer that's blocking the sunlight. And so these are the, the conditions in the first day of Genesis. No author writing more than 3,400 years ago could have accurately described these events and their sequence plus the initial conditions without divine inspiration. Genesis 1 is consistent with the rest of the scriptures and with nature's record, thus greatly strengthening the proclamation that the Bible is an inspired inerrant text. Only with an educational background that includes a scientific method can one faithfully comprehend God's beauty, power, and care in his creative acts. This interpretation of the text, its viewpoint and initial conditions and perspective on the prior existence of the sun, moon, and stars that later become visible on the fourth day, dates back to the era before modern science, at least back to the late 1600s. Uh, Robert Newman, John Snow, Herman Eckelman, William Henry, Green, and Daniel Wonderly, all with advanced degrees in science and theology, published a similar interpretation of Genesis 1 in 1977. Uh, Gleason Archer offered this perspective first in 1955, followed later by many prominent works. It is neither new nor novel. Early Scholarly Investigations of Noah's Flood the beginning of my research into Noah's Flood shortly began after I became a Christian in 2009 at the age of 21. It will be fair to admit that, though many scholars have investigated the topic, very few have considered a specific locality relative to the Genesis story, uh, specifically where Eden is located and thus roughly where Noah would be located. The earliest scholar that I could find bearing any hint to proposing the Persian Gulf was Ephraim Spizer. Quote, The ultimate inspiration for the Mesopotamian cycle of flood narratives can only be a matter of guesswork at this time. Perhaps the best chance of a likely solution lies in the recent disclosures concerning the geological background of Lower Mesopotamia. It now appears that not very long ago, as geological ages are reckoned, waters from the Persian Gulf submerged a large coastland area, owing probably to a sudden rise in sea level. If that rise was precipitated by extraordinary undersea eruptions, 
the same phenomena could also have, have brought an extremely heavy uh, the same phenomenon could also have brought on extremely heavy rains the whole leaving an indelible impression on the survivors all this however must remain in the realm of speculation though he suggests that we ought to keep this as mere speculation he was actually on the right track the reason why this was considered speculation is because of the fact that research in this topic was virtually non non-existent and only in the last decade have there been scientific investigations completely removed from any association with the details in genesis into the geology of that localized region relative to the ever-growing data of human origins before these modern investigations everyone could see that the mention of the tigris and euphrates, euphrates rivers in Genesis 2.14 indicated the garden's possible location within Mesopotamia. However, the Pishon and Gion rivers were hard to identify. Thus, unsubstantiated speculations that they might have been smaller river channels or part of the Tigris and Euphrates systems, or they might have disappeared, becoming dry river beds. But scholars like Kenneth Kitchen, along with the Lions of Spicer, argued that these four rivers came together in Mesopotamia to form a single stream that ran into the Garden of Eden. He proposed that the rivers are listed starting with the Pishon, located in a southwesterly direction, and then proceeds in a counterclockwise fashion across the east to the Gihon, north of the, to the Tigris, and finally northwest to the Euphrates. Uh, thus, with remarkable accuracy, he proposed that the Garden of Eden was located at the northern end of the Persian Gulf. Well, now we now confidently call this region the Persian Gulf Oasis in the Arabian Peninsula. It's a region that was occupied by early humans during the late Pleistocene between 70,000 years ago and 13,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age, and hence the advent of the Holocene. So here's the the... At 70,000 years ago, here's the, the Persian Gulf that would have been dry, and the Garden of Eden would be situated at the head of these four rivers, as the Genesis text talks about. My flood model. In, first to, in, in order to lay out my flood model, I will need to first treat Genesis 1 to 11 as a complete package primeval story. Uh, where Genesis 1 starts off by first detailing for us an accurate chronology of the natural history of Earth. So this showcases the fact that I see the days from 1 to 6 as chronicling natural history of the planet. Um, so verse 1, you're talking about the creation of the universe. And then verse 2, you're talking about the early conditions of the earth so day one would correspond with these over here and um, and so for example day three speaks about the emergence of uh, vegetation and sure enough uh, the, at the time that this chart was made it says here if you can see this it says um, some scientists believe the first land plants arrived roughly 650 million years ago which, you know, is corresponding very close to day four because sunlight's emerging. But actually, recent isotope evidence shows that this this can go back much earlier, roughly 1.5 billion uh, with new isotope evidence, uh, which was found in 2009. And I, I think also they found fossils in, in 2011. So it goes much earlier. So again, the, the story, the chronology is, is perfect. And at the end, you have humans right at the end, uh, in day six. Starting with the first two days of creation, we read, When the earth was as yet unformed and desolate, with the surface of the ocean dips shrouded in darkness, and, the, and while the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters, God said, Let there be light. So there was light. God saw that the light was beautiful. He separated light from the darkness, calling the light day and the darkness night. The twilight and the dawn were day one. 
Then God said, let there be a canopy between bodies of water, separating bodies of water from bodies of water. So God made a canopy that separated the water beneath the canopy from the waters above it. And that is what happened. God called the canopy sky, the twilight and the dawn were the second day. Then God said, let the water beneath the sky come together into one area and let dry ground appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and he called the water <coughs> that had come together oceans. And God saw, God saw how good it was. At the start of verse 2, from a concordance perspective, we see the earth 4.5662 plus or minus 0.0001 billion years ago as a chaotic amorphous mass of cooling gases not yet in its present spherical shape. Soon after, between 4.1 and 3.8 billion years ago, we see that the Earth's next primeval condition is that it's dark on the surface while completely covered with water. A 2009 study has shown that primordial Earth must have originally been a water world where late heavy bombardment comets deliver the equivalent of a one kilometer deep global ocean. No continents uh, rose above the water, and the whole, the whole of Earth's watery surface remained in darkness. No light from the sun reached through due to the thick atmosphere in this early stage. All planets start with opaque atmospheres. Thick layers of hydrogen, helium, methane, and ammonia surround them. This gas cloud, combined with a dense shroud of interplanetary dust and debris, guarantees that no sunlight or starlight can reach the surface of a primordial planet such as early Earth. The last phrase of verse 2 says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The Hebrew word for hovering is merahepet, or, or the root being rahap, and it appears only one other time in Deuteronomy 32.11 as yerahep. This has led some linguists to infer that the spirit's hovering over the waters refers to life's origination in Earth's ocean, even before light for photosynthesis shone through. Uh, this interpretation goes back to the early church where we read of Ephraim writing, quote, the Holy Spirit warmed the waters with a kind of vital warmth, even bringing them to a boil through intense heat in order to make them fertile. The action of a hen is similar. It sits on its eggs, making them fertile through the warmth of incubation. Earth's geology testifies that marine life did indeed arise before all other life forms. The oldest fossils found to date show us unicellular marine-like organisms in clearly identified marine sediments. What follows in verses 3 to 8 is the transformation of the atmosphere that leads it to a stable water cycle. This in turn follows in verses 9 to 10 in a summary of Earth's tectonic profile showcasing relatively fixed shorelines where the oceans will never again cover the entire Earth, as was initially the case in the early stages of the planet's formation. Evidence for this is via osmium isotope analysis where land masses occur in pulse states, affirming that the Earth will never undergo a global deluge. This is precisely the exegesis of David, Job, Solomon, and Jeremiah with respect to Earth's tectonic profile. Uh, that is a later global flood contradict. So if, if Noah's flood is, is global, then, I know, then that would contradict this, oh, what, what the, the statements that you see elsewhere in the Old Testament. And so these statements are, you covered the primeval ocean like a garment, this is Psalm 104, uh, David. You covered the primeval ocean like a garment. This, the water stood above the mountains. They flee at your rebuke. They rush away at the sound of your thunders. Mountains rise up and valleys sink to the place you have ordained for them. You have set a boundary they cannot cross. They will never again cover the earth. Uh, this one is um, Job 38. Who enclosed the sea with limits when it gushed out of the womb? When I made clouds to be its clothes and thick darkness its swaddling blanket. When I prescribed a boundary for it, set in place bars and doors for it, and said, you may only, 
you may come only this far and no more. Your majestic waves will stop here. Uh, Proverbs 8. I was there when he marked out a circle on the face of the deep, when he made a cloud from above, when the springs of the depths were established, when he set a boundary for the sea so that waters would not exceed his limits, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Uh, Jeremiah 5. I'm the one who put the sand as a boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot cross. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail against it. Though they roar, they cannot cross it. Finally, what about the New Testament? We have Peter twice saying, and if he did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a righteous preacher, along with seven others, when he brought the world uh, when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly people. And that's in Second Peter 2 verse 5. And <clears throat> this one is, The world at that time, Tote Cosmos, was deluged uh, with the water and destroyed. Uh, that's Second Peter 3 verse 6. So Peter joins the word cosmos with the qualified Tote. Therefore, Greek linguists highlight that it should read, Humanity as it then was. So, again, if Peter's thinking global flood, um, then the qualifier actually means he's speaking of the humanity at the time was sludged with water. Obviously, humanity at that time was not global. It, the humanity was localized. So, therefore, it's a localized flooding, if you look at it this way. Michael Heiser nails it. Quote, our concern is with the biblical text and its own evidence for a local flood. First, the phrases in the flood narrative that suggest a global event occur a number of times in the Hebrew Bible, where their context cannot be global or include all people on the planet. For example, the phrase, the whole earth, Kolaret, occurs in passages that clearly speak of localized geography. Genesis 39, 40, 41 57. Leviticus 25, 9 and 24, Judges 6, 37, 1 Samuel 13, verse 3, <clears throat> 2 Samuel 24, 8. In such cases, whole land or all the people of, in the area are better understandings. Those options produce a regional flood event if used in Genesis 6 to 8, where the phrase occurs. Second, Genesis 9.19 clearly informs us that the whole earth was populated by the sons of Noah. Genesis 10 gives us the list of the nations spawned by the sons of Noah, all of which are located in the regions of the ancient Near East, the Mediterranean and the Aegean. The biblical writers knew nothing of nations in another hemisphere, the Americas, or places like India, China, or Australia. The language of Genesis 10, therefore, allows Genesis 7.21 to be restricted to only or even some of the people groups listed in the Table of Nations. That interpretation is consistent with the localized flood. Third, the phrase, all humankind, call Adam, used in Genesis 7.21, also appears in contexts that cannot speak to all humans everywhere. For example, Jeremiah 32.20 and Psalm 64.9 can only refer to people who had seen what God had done, not people on the other side of the world. Lastly, as I demonstrated above, but Heiser repeats it, uh, Psalm 104 verse 9 forbids, uh, appears to forbid a global flood, since it has God promising to never cover the earth with water, as had been the case at creation. Next, we need to analyze human migration patterns relative to the Genesis story. Because in what location are the events of Genesis 6 to 9? In the sixth day of creation, we read, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image to be like us. Let them be masters over the fish in the ocean, the birds that fly, the livestock, everything that crawls on the earth and over the earth itself. So God created mankind in his own image. In his own image, God created them. He created the male and female. God blessed these humans by saying to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Be masters over the fish in the ocean, the birds that fly, and every living thing that crawls on the earth. 
Notice that there is no mention of a single pair. The text explicitly details a pre-Adamic human population. Furthermore, Genesis 2 verse 4 to, verse 4 to 25 is not a recap recapitulation of what uh, happened on the sixth day, but rather a sequel. Evidence for this lies in the fact that Genesis 2.4 uses the literary Toledot formula as seen throughout Genesis that highlights its sequential context. So for example, Genesis 5 verse 1 is a parallel sequel to Cain and Seth. Genesis 6.9 is a sequel to pre-flood conditions which leads to Noah. Genesis 10 verse 1 is a sequel to Noah and Sons which then leads to the Table of Nations. Genesis 11.27 is a sequel to Shem's descendants, which leads to Terah and Abraham. Genesis 25.12 is a sequel to Abraham that leads into Ishmael. Um, uh, Genesis 36.1 is a sequel to Isaac Jacob, which then leads to Esau's family. And Genesis 36.9 is a sequel to Esau's family that leads to Esau's line. It's also important to note that Though Genesis 1 is ambiguous with respect to the timing and location of humans, Genesis 2 is explicit. Uh, and this is starting in verse 5. No shrubs had yet grown in the meadows of the earth, and no vegetation had sprouted, because the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there were no human beings to work the ground. Instead, an underground stream would rise from the earth and water the surface uh, of the ground. So the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, uh, breathed life into his lungs, and the man became a living being. The Lord God... Uh, one second, I'm just making sure the, my microphone's working. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden toward the east where he placed the man whom he had formed. The Lord God caused every tree that is both beautiful and suitable for food to spring up out of the ground. The tree of life is also in the middle of the garden, along with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows from Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides, becoming four branches. The name of the first one is Pishon. It winds to the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is pure. Bedellium and onyx are also found there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The third river is named the Tigris. It flows to the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. In summary, I see Genesis 1 as highlighting pre-Adamic humans that, that multiply into a large enough population to fill the earth. These humans migrated northeast out of Africa are in a scene in Genesis 2. They arrive into the Arabian Peninsula, where specific geographical details are given in verses 5 to 6, along with the mention of four rivers in verses 10 to 14. And sure enough, Archaeologist Jeffrey Rose has reported on the discovery of over 60 new archaeological sites along the shoreline of the Persian Gulf. The arrival of humans into this region brought a huge and rapid leap in tool technology. Axes, needles, hammers, uh, barbed fish hooks, shovels, harpoons, permanent stone houses, long distance trade networks, decorated pottery, domesticated animals, and possibly the oldest boats in the world. He highlights that this landmass was well watered by four large rivers following at the time. And, and notice, compare this with Genesis 2, verse 10 to 14. Uh, the, the Tigris, Euphrates, Karun, and Wadi Batin uh, rivers. Additionally, the region was watered by fresh water springs supplied by subterranean aquifers for, uh, flowing beneath the Arabian subcontinent, and hence compare with Genesis 2, 6. Such an abundant and well-distributed supply of fresh water combined with the region's warm weather would have supported a lush agricultural enterprise. Thus, during the latter part of the, of the last ice age, a thriving civilization existed here. As sea levels rose and as water uh, rushed in through the Strait of Hormuz, 
to fill up the Persian Gulf, people would have exited the uh, Gulf oasis and formed settlements along the rising shoreline. We can now specifically show that the Pishon and Gihon flow out from the mountains of southwest Arabia, which is in Havila, down here. And northeast Arabia, which is Kush, while the Tigris and Euphrates flow out from the mountains of Ararat in Armenia and Turkey. What was considered as pure conjecture by Spizer in the 1960s is now confirmed by Rose, by what Rose identifies as the Gulf Oasis. Therefore, Noah's flood would have occurred uh, roughly 13,000 years ago near the end of the Holocene in this region. And what's the evidence for this? Well, it, this is this is specifically highlighted, most importantly, in a 2015 paper, where evidence for sudden flooding within a very short time took place. Scientists since the 1990s initially postulated a gradual rise of water in this region that took place over thousands of years. However, the abstract of Muhammad Bastawezi's uh, 2015 paper reads, quote, Quaternary uh, lake bed deposits have been recorded in different parts across Arabia, which are now drained by the eastward flowing drainage networks from Al Sarawat Mountains. The analysis of digital elevation model, uh, satellite images, and geological maps show that the lake bed uh, deposits are mainly contained within the Great Arch Depression occupying the trough between Al Sarawat Mountains in the west and the escarpment of to wake in the east and Hadar Mot Plateau in Yemen from the south to Wadi Sahan depressions near the Syrian Jordanian border in the north. The basins within this mega depression have been interconnected by tributary flows, which was consequent in the north northward direction. The conspicuous ridge of Tuwek, which extends northward for about 800 kilometers and rises for approximately 200 meters above its western floor, have been breached by numerous subsequent deep incised canyons and funnel-shaped cuts carved at different elevations. The formation of several wadi canyons uh, and funnel cuts along the entire extent of Tuwek clearly suggest that the breaching of this conspicuous escarpment was sudden and rapid, as the northern outlet of this mega lake was insufficient to discharge the water. The overflow arms have developed extensive alluvial fans on the Arabian coast. The fans of Wadi al-Batin cover approximately, so that Wadi al-Batin would be the, uh, the, the Pishon River specifically, so in this region here, which in this bottom photo you're talking about over here, like roughly. Uh, covered approximately 60 square kilometers in South Iraq, Kuwait, and northeastern parts of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the age dating of the quaternary deposits in different localities suggests the occurrence of this event roughly between 13,000 and 8,500 years before present. However, the discrepancies could be related to technical issues or the scarring of older bed deposits and its entrainment in the younger deposits of this great flood. So using, um, using satellite imagery of the Iranian Peninsula, the left image is an approximate rendition of the land masses around Arabia prior to Noah's flood. With ice still covering much of the North America, Siberia, Europe, and the Arabian mountains, global sea levels would have been lower, resulting in dry areas 150 meters below sea level. The right image shows the possible, so this, this is a possible artistic rendition uh, at its maximum peak, uh, uh, which would be in this case uh, 750 square kilometers of water, reaching up to the Armenian region of Mount Judy. So Mount Judy would be um, just at the tip over here. So just just over here. Um, reaching up to the Armenian Mount the region of Mount Judy, which is Kordur in Aramaic, where the Ark sets to rest. English translations read, the Ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat on the 17th day of the seventh month. However, the mountains of Ararat are located in the Lake Van region 
of eastern Turkey in the area of Armenia, known as Uratu in Assyrian inscriptions. With its highest peak reaching 17,000 feet, in contrast to a range of mountains, the Gilgamesh epic describes the flood heroes are coming to rest on a specific mountain top, Mount Nemush, formerly rendered Nissa, in southern Kurdistan. The only hint to its location is that it is said to be in the land of the Gutium, which is in the Zagros Mountains east of the Tigris and near the Dayala. The modern-day Pur Omar uh, Gudrun is generally considered the strongest candidate. This is placed at roughly 645 kilometers southeast of Ararat. So here's where Mount Ararat is located. Here's Lake Van. And according to the ancient Near Eastern text, the Ark comes to rest over here, roughly over here. And Mount Judy is roughly around over here. So there's a very close correlation between the Genesis text and also the ancient Near Eastern literature. So this scholarly detail uh, goes back to an excellent paper published in 1971 by Edward Lipinski de detailing an interesting geographical locality of Yahweh's abode in Eden relative to Noah and the Apkalu, which the Apkalu has a long mythical history in Genesis 6, 1 to 4, the whole Sons of God episode and the Daughters of Men. Uh, he writes, in the Gilgamesh epos, this godly country, meaning Eden and where God's located, uh, corresponds most likely to Uratu, the later Arminia, and it may re reasonably be supposed that this location is reflected in Genesis 8.4, which makes Noah's Ark land on the mountains of Uratu. The old pronunciation Uratu is attested by the spelling Hurarat in Isaiah 37.38, read in the great Isaiahic manuscript from Quran, Qumran. Evidence for Mount Judy, which is located in Uratu, as the location of Noah's Ark, can be seen in the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Targums, which have Kordu there, uh, the Book of Jubilees, Josephus, Julius Africanus, Eusebius, the Peshitta. Peshitta also has Kordu and Epiphanius. I also find it hilarious that Ken Ham has used modern industrial technology that didn't exist in Noah's day to construct his imaginary Noah's Ark with base 10 measurements of 450 by 75 by 45 feet. However, the materials Noah used was, a, was from a dismantled reed hut the size, likewise, would have been equivalent to a modern-day yacht, since the dimensions given should be understood via base 60. All these misconceptions are due to translator ignorance, or lack of data, that have only recently surfaced from ancient Near Eastern studies. When we use the King James Version, this is what we read about the Ark. Make thee an Ark of gopher wood, rooms, shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. It is recently understood that the three Hebrew words that appear for gopher wood, rooms, and pitch all derive from Akkadian. So here you have the, the word for gopher is gupru, the, the word for rooms is kani'i, and the, the pitch is actually Kupru. So therefore this is how the verse should read. Make for yourself a vessel of stalks from a reed hut. With reeds you will make the vessel and tar it inside and out with butumen. Therefore a visual aid of what it might have looked like would be the equivalent to the mudhif reed house by the Madan people. So it's literally like a reed boat, but that is vastly different from the size and scale of Noah's Ark and the weight as well in that context. And it, it's 
it's a natural fit with the culture of the time and the technology of the time as well. Finally, we must conclude with respect to the species that experienced this deluge 13,000 years ago. Uh, here are the type of species saved on the ark. So you have the Bissar, the Bahima, the Haya, the Nefesh, uh, the Op, Ramez, and Sapor, all, all these Hebrew terms that are associated with these definitions. Um, you know, Bissar is basically, it means flesh, but specifically the, that used in Jewish sacrifice. A behema would be beast, animal, cattle, any large four for and mammals. Uh, the haya, anything that's living, it could include um, wild animals in this case, like a lion or something. Nefesh, which is just a word that means life, soul, creature, any any uh, species that has the, uh, the capability of ex expressing emotions. So like your pet, like household pets would be an example of nefesh. Uh, Ramez, any, anything that's creeping around or can be included with like rodents and lat small land mammals and so on. Sapor just means bird. Um, also op, uh, fowl, insect, bird. Here, the, here are the type of species not saved. So the type of species is, is the Sharez and the Yakum um, which again, both of these are prolific small animals such as amphibians, smaller reptiles, flying insects, wriggling water animals, and so on. And um, a being of, and Yakum is basically a being of any kind, human or animal, in the state of biological life, specifically any creature that resides in an agricultural household. So it must be noted that this list of Hebrew words correlate with the species mentioned on the sixth day of creation. Therefore, both lists, those saved and not saved, do not involve species that appear in the fifth uh, epoch, which in the Concordus model is designating the Cambrian 540 million years ago up until the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. In fact, this list becomes more spe specific in Job 38 and 39, allowing us to narrow down what type of species are possibly associated with the Ark 30,000 years ago. Gleason Archer writes, the, dis the district of Uz in which the action took place, he's speaking of Job here, that the district of Uz in which the action took place was located in northern Arabia. The Septuagint refers to it as the land of the Asite, uh, a people whom Ptolemy, the geographer, locates in the Arabian uh, desert adjacent to the Edomites of Mount Seir. The species that are possible to have been to have been on the ark include the lion, raven, goat, deer, donkey, wild ox, ostrich, horse, hawk, and eagle. And is there a correlation with Job's list of animals that are, are obviously because Job Job's again situated here in the uh, Arabian Peninsula? Is there a correlation? And yes, a 2016 paper highlights a direct proportion with the list of species mentioned in Genesis and Job that would have interacted with Noah, thus no inclusion of polar bears, emperor penguins, or dinosaurs. And here are um, some snapshots of that study showcasing the, uh, the years and the species involved with uh, cave art. Um, and uh, here are the correlations of such species. And as you can see, most of this is mentioned in the Book of Job. All right, thank you very much. I hope this has been educational. And I look forward to the next, uh, you know, session. <laughs> <laughs>